Quebec or Montreal, but um, uh, there was some in the, uh, the zoo scenes I noticed were shot in the Taiwan Zoo. And there's some other travel as well involved. Um, all the scenes on the ocean were shot in a water tank. I don't know which one. There are a couple around the world that are well known for size and quality. Um, and uh, the other myth I'd like to dispel is that uh, the animals we saw swimming, the tiger swimming was a real tiger, but the tigers on the boat were CGI, computer generated. Now, often with uh, CGI, they will photograph real animals or real people and record their facial gestures or their movements. And then they will reproduce them in the uh, computer generated version, um, including the lift of eyebrows and the snarl of lips and nostrils flaring. Uh, they can even control the hairs on the body when they prickle and stand up. Um, this film was done uh, still a decade ago, but they could do that even then. Um, it's just more uh, sophisticated now. So I don't mean to burst your bubble. Um, I, I love the tiger. I mean, you should watch that animal forever, wh whatever he was. <clears throat> and in a way that's a parable for the whole film itself. The key question in this film is, which story do you prefer? <laughs> do, do, do you see the tiger as a computer generated dance of electrons on your uh, pixels on your laptop? or do you prefer to see it as a real animal with feelings, right? And translate that, that then to the whole film. Do you prefer to see this as a story the boy made up or a real, exp uh, real experience he survived? Uh, it, and did he make it up because the actual experience was so horrific he couldn't bear to face it, just like the insurance adjusters at the end, right? And the, the film is kind of non-committal about that. I, you know, I hate to talk about endings uh, at the beginning of our discussion, but even uh, Ifran Khan, uh, the grown-up Pi, says to uh, Spall, uh, it's for you to decide, it's your story now. So for me, this is a whole metaphor for religion and contemporary life. You know, what do you take from it? What do you ignore? So I, I'd like to couch our discussion tonight in that. Since we're a synagogue sponsored group, we have no obligation to you know, keep it Jewish or anything in particular. Um, but uh, I, I think it's appropriate that you know, this film is, is um, certainly it's answering questions that our clergy sometimes addresses. And I hope it's questions that you all sometimes address because this is the point um, of life and of movies. <laughs> and I suppose of the religious experience. Um, uh, I prefer movies, as you know. But uh, let's start at the beginning. This opening I thought was astonishingly beautiful. And it's often said that Ang Lee, the Chinese director of this film is a visual artist. And this film above all confirms it. I mean, yes, he has an eye for great things. Um, he did Brokeback Mountain, he did many other films. Um, and uh, he's a really talented filmmaker. Um, uh, doesn't live in China anymore. I think he lives in Manhattan, could be wrong. And uh, this film has a visual continuity to it throughout that I didn't notice the first time, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, when I saw it earlier this month and I decided to program it, I was so amazed at those shots of the boat alone on the water. You couldn't tell where it was. Was it in the sky above the sea, right? Or was it in the water and we were looking up at it from below? Was it floating in the cosmos? And I think this is the poetic vision of Ang Lee, the director. He's saying, this is a journey into the unknown and the exact coordinates of reality can never be documented. Not just because we're moving through it, but because that's just the nature of existence. So it, it, it's a lovely poetical notion and he bears it out visually time and time again and I, wa I wanted to use screen share tonight where we could see the images together, but I can't do that. I guess I had to uh, rip the, uh, the film off of Amazon or freeze frames and save them to show you. But I'm sure um, many of you noticed those shots where the boat is either floating on blackness 
or there's blue as when the, uh, the jellyfish were illuminating the water from below and the whale comes up or uh, when the ship goes down and he goes underwater. This is also a film that had a big Jewish consciousness behind it. Uh, I don't believe that the author of the novel was Jewish, although his name was Jan and uh, somebody could please look that up. Steve Greenberg, you know how to do that if you don't mind. Um, just go, go Wikipedia, Life of Pi and or uh, uh, Pro IMDb. I'll try, Jim. Yeah. And um, I... He's kind of an intellectual author, but there was a controversy, controversy about him and his credibility uh, relative to the Jewish community. And Steve, maybe you could look that up. I read that on Wikipedia. Um, I'm late coming to the meeting, so that's why I'm not as well prepared, ha ha ha, as I always am. Um, but uh, I, I believe after reading the Wikipedia on him that the, his soul was in good, Jan Martel, okay. Uh, so he could be Jewish. He's Canadian. Um, the film was financed by Canadian money and was shot mostly in Canada. And um, I don't know, by the way, the film uh, was optioned in 2002 by producers, I guess, and it went to other directors first. So he's like the fourth director who was connected to this film when they finally got funding to make it. Another surprising thing about this is that they got Leonard DiCaprio to play the author, now played by Raphael uh, Spall. And you've seen Raf Spall. Did anybody recognize him from another movie we've seen? Uh, A Beautiful Young Mind, where he plays the handicapped uh, mathematician who takes the young boy to the mathematics competition in Hong Kong. And opposite Sally Hawkins in that film, A Beautiful Young Mind. And it's funny. I, I. I kept thinking he was like um, some young semi heartthrob guy in his 20s when I saw it that I couldn't put my finger on. And then I realized in the credits that it's this guy from uh, Beautiful Young Mind. He's a British actor and has a totally American accent here. Um, and his story in a way is, is important too. So why don't we start our discussion there? Um, what is the author's story? Uh, I forget his name in the movie. Does it, did anybody pick up on that? The author's background. Okay, uh, Adult Pie read his second book and liked it very much, which was a compliment that was well received, uh, his first book. But he wrote a second book that never got published. And that's when he was in Pondicherry in India because the, his pounds or dollars could make him live longer and live better there than in London or wherever he was living because it's cheap to live in India. And that's where he met uh, the pseudo uncle, um, uh, uh, Gamaji or something like that. Uh, and that's the guy who taught him how to swim. This is the guy with the broad shoulders and the skinny waist. That was computer generated too. It's kind of a comic movie. And it, But before we get into that, because that just shows you what a great filmmaker Ang Lee is. His story is that he was a failure. He ran out of fuel to write this second novel. And he was moping around uh, uh, the Indian city. And he met this guy. He said, you want a story to tell? Go find my nephew. So the introduction was made. And lo and behold, the author finds himself in the home having lunch with the adult pie. What is this? This is a defeated man who's going to it was our vehicle. He's us, right? He's a man without beliefs. He's not religious. He's lost his motivation. He's, he's trying to start a new life. He's looking for inspiration. Uh, <clears throat> and again, the uncle says, uh, he's going to show you how to believe in God, right? So that's a challenge enough. And he shows up. There. I mean, they, they obviously checked in with each other before. So I, I want, that's the starting off point for this author who was very taken in by the story. Um, at the end of the story, he says, I don't know what to say. It's such a big story. So think of that author as us, those disaffected reformed Jews who aren't, you know, insanely fundamentalist. You know, we have a connection to a, an ethical and a, uh, a humanistic movement that's been around for 
thousands of years, which we're proud of and connected to emotionally. Um, I don't want to go any farther than that because I think most reform rabbis would want us all in the congregation, right? That's enough of a connection. So that's the author. Let's go back now and tell the story of the young boy. And I want to tell the young story, the story of the young boy by the New York Times Review from A.O. Scott, who's a pretty sharp critic, still writing today, along with Manola Dargis. And they, the two of them write the best film reviews, except maybe from those who find, you'll find occasionally in the New Yorker. And A.O. Scott was critical of this movie. He found it juvenile. And um, that surprised me because the boy, the young pie, falls in love with every religion. I suspect that A.O. Scott doesn't have any children of his own <laughs> um, and doesn't recognize that kids have imaginations that are huge and they get captured by them. So he was very critical uh, of the fascination with religions of the young boy. Did anybody else doubt that? Or did you look upon the young pie as a kindly grandson who's just discovering the world and the intellectual life and the emotional life that is there in front of him? Jeff Ellison, I think you're leaning forward to unmute yourself. You know, you know kids his age, right? You teach a day, Jewish day school. Was he familiar to you? Um, not not in the sense that 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 you're talking about i i think that uh he i'm not sure his age is really relevant okay him. i i th i think what it is is it's 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 just represents people who are trying to find um the ultimate meaning and uh trying to understand uh, why we're here and who we are. Um, and and it, the age isn't important. And I, and I think it raised issues about, for example, all the different religions. And then the father basically responds with another religion, which is that of reason and rationality, which is, um, uh, today's religion in a sense mm -hmm. and and the mother says something to the effect well um yes science will answer all of those questions except kind of what's in here right. they don't answer that question right. so that's how i kind of looked at it it, it wasn't an age thing Right, and rightly so. And that's what disappointed me about A.O. Scott is that how can you criticize, he took the film literally, that the boy is supposed to be, you know, that, that they impose this um, fascination with him. It could have been uh, video games. It could have been model race cars. It could have been anything that obsessed a kid of that age. Um, but the point is that there are a couple of very cogent comments um, there. Um, uh, uh, the three phases of religious enlightenment for him were the first religion he discovered was Krishna. Um, and remember, there's that moment where the story is that Krishna's mother looked into Krishna's mouth and saw the universe. Well, this points to Ang Lee's consistency as an artist, because the same image, the floating yellow and blue balls, you know, swirling around planets, that came back as what the tiger was looking at at the end of the film in that montage there. And then other animals come in and fish come in. Um, and it's like you're gazing into the cosmos, right? That's the meaning of that. And that's sort of uh, why I use the term cosmos to describe this scene of the boat floating in the cosmos. Because you're meant to be in this, the whole film is for us to be in this non-directed, I mean, Yes, a non-directed environment where we don't know what we are, and we don't know what to make of it. You know, like the insurance adjusters at the end. This is too fantastical. We can't believe this story. It can't be real. Give us a story we can understand. And of course, they don't report on the real story that's supposed to be real. They report, they report upon the tiger. So it's like they chose that story as well as the author. 
Um, the second religion is Christianity. And he thanks Krishna, Krish, uh, sorry, Vishnu for introducing him to Jesus. <laughs> and, you know, it's like a handoff of, oh, the next cool thing is uh, Christianity. And uh, there's that very cute, uh, you know, the brother says, here, I'll give you two rupee if you drink the holy water. And the priest catches him at it and gives him a lesson about uh, God's love for people. And he still doesn't get it. So he returns back to the priest and says, I don't get it. You know, um, the innocent should atone for the, uh, the uh, offenders. And uh, there's a lesson there for him. He says, ultimately, uh, I learned faith from Hinduism and I learned um, love through Christ and I learned God through Islam, Allah, which is not supported as well as the others, but it's there. And then, then the Judaism kicks in. Um, the author asks him, but what about Judaism? He says, oh yeah, I teach that too. <laughs> and it's very interesting. This uh, again, th this is probably from the book. It, it was in the book. In the book, the, um, uh, the adult Pi teaches at a university in Montreal, as he does in the film. And there's a scene where he's giving a lecture about Isaac Luria. He's a Kabbalistic scholar from the 16th century. And um, you may know uh, Luria because he teaches the Kavana. The, that is, uh, before we pray, we have to pray for the right frame of mind, the right spirit to pray to God. This is like uh, uh, wel welcoming the Sabbath queen on Friday night. It's the warm up to make sure we're of a frame of mind to go through the rest of the service. And um, so that's in the book, but they didn't, chose not to do that in the film. Instead, um, guess what? What's the name of the ship that goes down? Anybody remember? Probably not, because it's symptom. 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 And, and what is symptom? Does anybody know? Contraction. That's right. And what is contraction of what? Of the universe. No. When God created the universe, God had to contract oh. and extract himself oh. from the universe so that the creation could flourish. Okay, so that, that's quite a different, you know, that's a pretty remarkable thought. That's why God can, can't be known. He's outside the realm of understanding. So it's self-justifying, as many religions are, and especially many occult or uh, uh, fringe uh, spin-offs some religions are. Um, but they serve a purpose. You know, they're supporting some fundamental belief of the divinity. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But I'm just saying this is common to so much of religious uh, enthusiasm, especially on the, on the parts of fringe people until they start talking about invaders from outer space or you know, conspiracy theories here on earth. Um, so it's in some, and it comes up, uh, you see it on the hull of the ship when it goes down. But um, when it does go down, it's lit illuminated from the bottom as though all the lights of the ship are still on. Right, it's that fabulous shot. The boy is underwater looking for his family and he sees the ship sinking behind him. It's one of the images I wanted to show you, but won't be able to. Um, and this is not a reality show. So we can't say, oh, that would never happen. The generators would have shut down. Please mute yourself, whoever is, we're hearing that from. Um, and uh, it's magical realism. You know, this film is really a, uh, is all magical realism because we're asked to believe that, you know, a tiger who's so expressive, who listens to English commands um, and other things. Uh, but it sets the stage for this magic period where even underwater, the boy is drifting the cosmos he doesn't understand because the same lighting technique is used to show the jellyfish and the whale rising up. Uh, and even the boat itself against uh, the sky. And, and uh, I'll, we'll, we'll continue to talk about the boat. Sometimes it looks like the camera is above the boat and the water's below. And sometimes it doesn't. Um, uh, there may be fish going by. Uh, the light sources are unknown. 
it's, it's this uh, disconnection from the real world. You could say, according to Isaac Luria, it's God's view of the lostness of this individual in the world he's swimming in or the night sky he's swimming in. Sometimes it looks like the sky is the dark sea below them. You know, it, it, there were remarkable images in this. And uh, he didn't run out of exciting ways to frame the, the symbolism of the ship adrift at sea. Because we're talking about a young man's uh, moral compass, his spiritual compass, not that I use that word so often, but uh, it's anybody trying to find themselves in this world universe that we find ourselves. Where is my place in it? Which is what Jeff, you said. Um, so this is throughout the film, we see images like this. So uh, the Judaism comes in through um, that Lurianic reference. And uh, I think it's a great key for why throughout the film, the boy questions God. He rails at the storm at the end. You've beaten me, I submit. I've lost everything. Show me the way. What can I do? You know, and, and it's like he's reduced to a position of ecstasy. Um, you know, sometimes religions, uh, especially those where ecstatic dance is practiced, uh, speaking in tongues is a form of religious ecstasy. And he's at that point where he's just waiting for a sign and it never comes. Fortunately, he goes to sleep and he wakes up on the poisonous island with the meerkats. I, I'm getting a little ahead of ourselves, but you see this, every part of this film suggests another part that will come up. They reinforce each other. And that's real filmmaking. He, he's, he's into a theme and the, the theme is dripping off of every scene, even though they're different. It's, it's just remarkable remarkable filmmaking. And it's done visually so often, not just with words, although this film couldn't exist without words. Um, does anybody want to chime in? Um, I know I'm doing all the talking, but I have so many. Okay, the brother, Brad. You're on mute. I'm, I'm muted. Yeah. Okay. You know, in, in literature, when you talk about a tiger, you can't help but think of the uh, Robert Blake poem, Tiger, ti Tiger Burning Bright in the Forest of the Night. And William Blake asks these same questions. What is, what, is, what is the nature of this God? And he specifically says, you know, what kind of God would create both the tiger and the lamb? Right. And in this uh, movie, Pi, in both, in the two versions of the story, he is at once the tiger and the lamb in the two different versions. Mm -hmm. And the scene where uh, they're approaching land uh, after one of those horrible storms and the, they're both sitting on the ship or the, the, the raft together lying there, um, we're in the world of Isaiah. And I'm mixing my, man, uh, my animal metaphors here, but the, but the lion is lying with the lamb at that point through their mutual dependencies on each other. They, they reach a messianic kind of state where they are able to, to lie together on the raft. And, and that is because they've both been through the same agonizing experience through hell. Uh, they're both on the verge of death. Uh, Pi can articulate it. Uh, uh, Roger Parker can only just feel it, you know, it's, but he's as aware as, as uh, Pi is of it. Um, Thank you for that. That's a really great um, uh, thing to bring into this discussion. Um, where do we have Esty joining us. Um, anyone else want to chime in with any observations so far? Okay, I'll just keep going. There's so much to discuss on this. Um, we got through this. Can I just answer that initial question you asked about, about the author? Yes, please. Jan or John Martel was born in Salamanca, Spain to uh, French Canadian parents who had very uh, French names. So I'm guessing that he's of Catholic uh, uh, background. Could be. Could be. 
there, there is that funny saying where uh, as a Hindu, I'm the most Catholic of all because I get to feel <laughs> in front of thousands of gods. <laughs> right. There's lots of humor in this like that. I, I love that. Yeah. Anything else to it from that? Jim, can you hear me? It's Miriam. Yes, Miriam. Um, I saw this movie three times. I know a few of us here have, even maybe perhaps more. I saw it the first time. Um, I didn't love it. I wasn't critical of it. I saw it somehow it didn't enter my consciousness the way I would have wanted it to, but it didn't. I saw it the second time. I liked it much, much better. Why and, was I, that? and I saw it for the third time this time, and I liked it a lot, and I'm ready to see it a fourth time. Uh, <laughs> so this, what happened? I, what did it do to you? What happened was that I found it, um, I found I was relating to it. That's what happened. I don't know why. I felt with the tiger I knew he would change because <laughs> I knew it. I saw the picture before. Uh, and um, I felt, wow, what human kindness can do. So it was very believable to me since uh, that marvelous woman in Africa who's been there for 100 years, I can't think of her, who tames the gorillas oh, and right. they come to her. You know, this Jane Goodall and uh, Diane Fossey, I think. Diane Goodall, perhaps. I, yes, uh, at any rate, um, you could see how a wild, and I'm putting that in quotation marks, a wild animal can react to love, to literally touching, to feeling love through someone's hands on him to total trust. And we know, of course, that people have uh, tamed all kinds of wild people as pet, wild animals as pets. But everything about this movie was believable to me. I did not view it critically. I viewed it as tremendous entertainment, which was very different than the first time I viewed it. Mm -hmm. um, I do have this question. We see him brought to some kind of rescue lying on this island. And his uh, ship was wrecked on this island, very fortunately. And we see him lying there. Then we see a group of men around him. Do we understand? This is what I find a little unbelievable. Do we find that... Parker, the tiger, went to a group of people on the island, found them, and showed the people where he was lying. Because if you're sitting in an encampment with others and a tiger walks into you a few feet from you, are you going to welcome this tiger? Are you going to take your gun and think that your life is at stake? What are you going to do? That's the only part of the movie. I found unbelievable that they let the tiger show this group where this dying man was or this uh, no. captured. I, I, I thought you were responding to the pictures because there's a shot of the tiger walking off and then the. the That's next right. Person. That's next right. Person. How did they find him? Well, it's in the text. It's in the, uh, the speech. And I know it can be missed. Um, it's often sometimes very much helpful to watch a film with subtitles because then you don't miss the content. What Young Pai says is that a solitary fisherman found me and went back to his village and got other people to help rescue me. Oh, okay. It wasn't the tiger. Okay. So I don't want to get lost there because that, that scene is all about the heartbreak of uh, Roger Parker not turning back to even look at the guy. So it, this is, you know, it, it's like his feeling, I'll quote a famous Jewish expression, what am I, chopped liver to you? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you were chopped liver, but I didn't eat you because you provided other stuff for me. Okay, maybe not such a good joke, but uh, his, his feelings are hurt because he invested his love, his life, he, he, 
even before that moment, he said, this tiger allowed me to get through this experience. That's love, that's human connection. Despite his father's warning, what you see in an animal's eyes is just a reflection of your own feelings. That said, the adult pie says to the author, I felt this, it was real to me. And, and this is a, a famous you know, um, saying that the, the master's degree psychologists love to say, you can't contradict somebody else's feelings. So don't say their feelings are wrong because you can't. There's no wrong feeling, the feeling is real. It may be misguided or misdirected or come from a, a, a mistake, mistaken thing, um, but feelings are real. And, and this is another way of approaching the central problem of which story do you prefer? Could this have really happened? Or is it a metaphor for a human experience that was too horrible for the insurance reporters to, to record and submit? You know, where is your tolerance for, for human gruesomeness? You know, I, I mean, there are people killing each other and using each other for bait and then slashing his mother and throwing her to the sharks. And, you, you know, it's like they didn't want to write that, you know, be, because I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe today it would be, you know, believable or acceptable. Either way, neither story. And this is a very important point. And it goes back to the mother father issue. Neither story tells why the ship went down, right? Why the ship went down is what we call a mechanistic explanation of the universe. It's the mechanics, the big bang theory, which I guess I can believe, uh, but not religiously because I don't. Uh, the mechanics tell you how something is possible. Pardon me, Jim, just a minute. Uh, uh, it's Frank. I, I, I wonder what leads you to, to that conclusion that, that, that it symbolizes that? Why, how do you draw that conclusion that that's what the intent is? The intent of the movie? No, the intent of the ship going down, you said that that symbolizes, et cetera. And how well, do, it's, what, it's well, how do you conclude that? The ship going down is him uh, separating himself from common reality and common perceptions. It's allowing him to be open enough and vulnerable enough to contemplate the mysteries of the universe, which the animals on board the ship teach him, both the brutality and the love and the interdependence. More so, than just a complete separation from life as he knew it. Well, it is. No, you're not wrong there. It, it is that. But you see, when we're isolated from all our reference points, then we can see new things. And uh, I won't go into my own background, but... Um, uh, that's how cults separate, let's say, Jewish kids, Jews from Jesus. They separate Jewish kids from their parents by saying, they're evil. They're not really good Jews. We're the good Jews, right? You need to separate yourselves. The Lubavitchers do the same thing, right? And other fundamentalist groups do the same thing. When my wife is watching uh, in the Kingdom of Heaven or something about the Mormon conspiracy, Mormon murders. And it's like, there's an evil group of people there who are using their faith to deceive other people to commit sins, you know, misleading people. A and that's why there's wisdom in what the father says. If you believe in everything, you believe in nothing. And to ground yourself, start with reason. But the film, ultimately, there is no reason because it takes us to a, a, a set, a, a binary choice conclusion that no reason can say one was true and one was not true. And I, I, I think that's so great. It, you know, it, it viscerally and emotionally takes us along on this very uh, flamboyant story of survival, which we love and is gorgeous to look at as challenging. It's, a, it's a, a cliffhanger. You're on the edge of your seat for two hours for the most part. And, um, it, it, it's, it's such a humanistic story. It's like, it's your story. You're going through it. You're loving getting to love the tiger like he is. Jeff, go, go ahead, please interrupt. Yeah, uh, I, I have a question about the island. Uh, when he gets to that, that swimming area, that pool, which again, looks like the eye of, yes, yes. of the cosmos. 
Mm -hmm. And in that I is both life and then death at the yeah. same time as he finds the, to the tooth. Right. So right. there seems to be kind of this, uh, a kind of a dual edge to this cosmology. Yeah. Not really messianic. But it's pro it's it's proposing that good and evil exist kind of ah, side by you. side, and further, I think at the end of the film, the tiger does, in his own way, see the boy. There's images um, as the tiger is going into the forest. He never looks back and, though, and, and and he did in a sense in his mind. The tiger too was looking back in the very last scenes of the film. Sure, what's he looking at? And the, you know, and then the boy sees the same thing, the animals yes. in the water. You're right. I, I think what we get, uh, concretely what we get, when the tiger walks up to the edge of the forest and he stops, you can read into his action, he realizes he's gonna leave his buddy behind. You know, uh, it may not have risen to the top of his cortex, but there's a sense of loss there. This this frame, uh, the beautifully rendered frame of a of a starved tiger, wobbly, shaking, slowly approaching, and then suddenly taking a leap into the jungle where he belongs. Um, uh, I think it's there. You, you know, even even without a look back, you know, he said that's the heartbreak that he didn't look back to acknowledge. And maybe that affirms that he was just an animal. I don't think that Pi really believes that. I think Pi really believes that he connected in a very deep emotional way with, with Robert Parker. Um, I, I don't think you can read the film any other way that that's how he felt. Um, so uh, how'd we get on to that, Jeff? It was a good comment. I have something to say. Yes, Susie. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it was an incredibly beautiful movie. I wish I could be as articulate as you are, Jim, and some of the other people who have made these wonderful comments. I will, when I saw it the first time, I was a skeptic. I looked at every scene the first time. That can't happen. That can't happen. <laughs> And that will never happen and whatever. This time, I just let myself go like my grandson would do. When I sit there and I watch cartoons with him, uh, I'll say, oh, my God, the mice, the mouse can't fly. Yes, it can, Granny. Yes, it can. Well, in your imagination, in mine last night watching it, it was exquisitely beautiful. Mm -hmm. I go with the ending that it's true. It is absolutely true. Related to all the stories that we are talking about in our Bible class and Rabbi David's Torah study. I mean, all these stories have so many miraculous things and so many unreal things on I'm just learning and I, and I thank you for selecting this movie because I'm learning to trust and let my imagination work for wow. me. It was good, really, I'm so, really good. I'm so glad, Susie, because that's really what movies are all about. It's often called sus willing suspension of disbelief. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. some of us have a problem because something that can't literally have happened throws us off and we miss what the real point is, the fiction point, fictive mm -hmm. point. And to really surrender to a movie, if it's worthy of it, some aren't. This one was worthy. Yes, right. That's the whole so, point. Go ahead. No, I'm, that, that's it. Uh, okay. But that's, that's exactly how it's supposed to work. It, it's very seductive. You can't, those images are irresistible. The tiger is gorgeous. The boy is empathetic. Um, you want him for a friend or a grandson. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's also present and real. Um, it allows us to sink our own self into the images. We are the people we see on the screen. We are the animals, even the meerkats. The animals, the animals at the end that looked like 
giant rats or some birds or they were weird penguins well that was the horror I, I mean somebody it may have been jeff who, or brad who said that good and evil coexist that the horrors and the beauty coexist together were those real are those uh, they're cgi uh, there, there were some fiction fictive animal uh, you know renderings and they're the last horrible thing of a fish with uh, tentacles out, outside its mouth coming to camera that that's not a real fish there may be something like it but um, the point is, it suggests what our imaginations can feel. I didn't mean the fish. Oh. I mean, the last scene that this island was covered with these bizarre meerkats. The meerkats. The meerkats. That's what they are? Yeah. yeah. You've never seen Lion King? <laughs> yeah, I did, but. <laughs> you should see it. It's a very good film, and in its well, own way. Truly will, you worthy. Spell, will you spell that, please? Lion King, L-I-O-N. Oh, what well, the animals are. Oh, meerkat, M-E-E-R-K-A-T. And there's a lovely exhibit at the LA Zoo, if oh, it's open. I have seen it. Okay. Uh, Brad? Maps like that. There were thousands of them. Yeah, that's, a, that's CGI. Oh, yeah, so. I just want to put in a quick plug for the book. I mean, I read the book many, many years ago. And I had an experience with that book that I have never had before. I, that the scenes with the uh, tiger on the raft with him were so realistically portrayed in the book that I actually had dreams about it, which I remember to this day. And I can't tell all these years later if this movie was faithful to the book, if it wasn't faithful to the book, but it was faithful by capturing the realism of that, of the encounter, which of course is totally unbelievable when you step back, but when you're in the middle of it, it's right. so, so, so real. Yeah, that's how movies work. They, they create a logic of their own, you know? And in, on the boat, it's like, oh, uh, young pie has an expression. Then we cut to the tiger. And what's causing that expression is what the tiger's doing. It's a back and forth. It's a, it's a dynamic relationship between the players that we interpret and understand as a human relationship. So we are seeing ourselves in the eyes of the two players, even though one's an animal and one's a human. And we do that when we're looking at humans on the screen too. You look at Meryl Streep, you say, oh my God, I know exactly what she's feeling. You know? <laughs> and many other actors, it's, it's, it's magic what happens when we look, we put ourselves in those shoes. Miriam, yeah. Unmute Miriam, please. The lower left corner, Miriam, just click on the red microphone. There you go. Okay. Um, people love their dogs. There's no doubt about them. People love them on all levels. They love them very, very deeply. They love them not as deeply. They love them as the very best friend. Uh, some people living alone can't even imagine living without their animals. So why is it such a stretch? It was not for me, by the way, to think that Pi could actually end up loving this ferocious tiger who is ferocious in his area where he lives. He is carnivorous. He can be hugely dangerous. All those things about tigers and yet, in this atmosphere, with Pi, and with Pi alone, and with Pi willing to literally touch this ferocious being, okay. why is it such a stretch to think that they can love each other? Well, it wasn't a stretch for you, but let's, so let's talk about that feeling that you had. Why was it possible for you to believe that relationship? It was easy for me. I wanted to. I had no reason not to believe it and have no reason not to believe what we might call one miracle that happens 
among the ordinary or the expected relationships of animals to human to two legged humans. Why can't we occasionally hear a story and accept it? Why should it not be believable? Well, I, I suggest that it's a threat to some people who are so well defended. It, it, to accept that you can have a relationship with an animal is to admit that you're vulnerable. Those of us who have pets. I mean, I spend more time on my knees than Cinderella cleaning up after my incontinent dog, right? At any time of day, including 3 a.m. And it, it, it's like, why do we do it? Because we're parenting, we're loving, we're accepting them into our lives. This is, they become part of our reality. But I think people who can't, there's some people who can't stand cats, you know, or dogs, or, you know, uh, a lot of people from other countries who didn't grow up with dogs because there was enough feeding the children and they couldn't feed a dog. Um, are uncomfortable, they think they're threatening. And there are wild dogs in other countries and other environments that are, should be feared. But I, I think what you're pointing to is our sense of human need for interconnectedness, even if it's with a tiger who is ordinarily threatening. Pai says during the journey, he kept me alive because I had a mission. I had to provide food for him. He couldn't eat the crackers that were in the survival kit for me. I had to get fresh water to him through the still or collecting rainwater. Um, I had to catch fish for him. I even fought over the big tuna, you know, that, that great scene um, of the flying fish that pummel the whole raft, right? It's like, it comes out of nowhere. No one has ever thought of that. What was it in the book, uh, uh, Brad, The Flying Fish? You don't remember? Um, I'm sure it was. It's too good a scene. Um, and the tuna who's leaping in the air to, to catch the flying fish to eat himself lands up in the boat. And then Pi and the tiger fight over the tuna because it's big prey. You know, yeah, the tiger will eat rats or the tiger will eat flying fish, but that's a that's a couple of dinners. So that's got his attention. They fight over it and they challenge territory over it and they challenge each other. And shortly after that, Pi establishes dominance. So um, it, it, it's, it's a matter, it's an expression of our vulnerability as human beings to accept that we need something else in our lives. Man cannot live by bread alone. Women do fine without bread. In fact, better, but that's another story. That's another joke that fell flat. I guess I have to go to Mitchell Stein to save myself from that and then Joel, the Joel Jasmine people. Mitch, what do you got? Lower left, unmute. Uh, lower left corner, the red microphone. There you go. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for encouraging me to watch it because 12 years ago, I saw the trailer and said, I'll never watch this movie. Why? Why? Tell us why. Because I saw the, this tiger and this uh, scene that they had in the trailer. And I said, this is not a movie that I want to watch. And it was a foolish decision I made because <clears throat> Jim Ruxin says, watch it. I watched it. And it was an incredible story that I uh, I just thrived in it. I, I was so mesmerized in it that I couldn't believe in two and a half, two and a quarter hours I probably didn't move an inch, mm -hmm. and it was it was just a, a treat. Um, I was wondering if you had any insight into the author's selection of uh, the zebra, the chimpanzee, and the oh. hyena and the tiger to uh, be left in from the zoo. Was there any uh, meaning to those animals? No, I haven't read the book. Maybe Brad can ring in. But the orang is a nursing mother. And she keeps, when the boat is going down, the big boat, she looks back because she's looking for a youngster. So that, that's a humanistic expression of a primate. And, and, so, and again, the mother in the second story, the orang becomes the mother, the nurturing one. So I, I think they were useful metaphors. I don't know if they had any sim symbolism beyond that. Um, 
the zebra being the, uh, the, the sailor who breaks his leg uh, or the zebra who breaks his leg. Um, you know, temperamentally, the, the, the guy, the, the Buddhist sailor who says, oh, eat the rice and the gravy, it's not me. You know, he's kind of silly, isn't he? And helpless as the zebra was. The zebra was expendable. So the hyena, who was the cook, you know, kills the, the orang and the, the zebra because he's a mean son of a bitch, but they survived. I, I saw it this time and I think, oh, he threw the, uh, the hyena threw the uh, orang overboard. You know, it's not clear what happens to the corpses. I, I, I take my chair to uh, my, my sister-in-law, Helene. You take your chair to your sister-in-law, Eileen, what does that mean? Helene, she's, that's Joel Jasper's wife. She, oh, oh, okay, we didn't know. Okay, <laughs> okay. You see, he sees his five minutes to you. <laughs> that's right. Unmute yourself. There's Joel. Now you are. Okay. Um, I thought going back to him as a child that the scene where his father makes him watch yep. the lion kill the, the lamb, was it? A goat. A goat. Yeah. When he, that foreshadows what's to come and teaches him an important lesson. It does, and he thanks his father. He says, I wouldn't have survived without my father's lessons. At the same time, though, it, it says dad didn't have it all correct. You know, um, it was a survival lesson, but what he learns is not to harden your heart because ultimately he violates his father's advice and befriends Rod, uh, Robert Parker and loves him. But not before he heeds his advice and separates right. himself. Yeah. Well, th isn't this the process of adulthood and becoming? I mean, this is very much the story of a sensitive human person, a young boy who's searching. And he looks like a juvenile and clearly He's a pubescent teenager on board the ship. You, you, you know, uh, so it, it's the process. It's a building's roman, the the story of growing up, of becoming an adult, becoming a moral conscience, and realizing all the mysteries that are inherent in our existence and in our uh, uh, mortal abilities to go beyond. You know, to penetrate more of our our lack of understanding than we do. Um, so all of that's supported. You know, you're, you're so right. Uh, I'd like to say something, Jim. Please you, do. I think you just hit the nail right on the head. Uh, the the growing up. I do think it's important that he's a young young boy. I I think we all go through these um, tests of our of our parents' teachings, and uh, we probably come around to more of them than we want to in the end. But um, I think it's very important that it's a young person because those are the ones that question religion. Those are the ones who are the Jewish kids who turn away, take a look at Hinduism or take a look at Christianity. Uh, they're looking, they're seeking because we've been told, we've been taught, at least Jewishly, I think we've been taught to question authority, to look at what's around us. and. So I think that's a very big part of this movie. And I think you hit the nail right on the head with what you just said. Well, uh, so did you, because I want to pursue that. Um, you know, what is there about Judaism that teaches that kind of uh, objective questioning yet still retains people? You know, I think that's what retains people right. is the freedom to say, this doesn't violate my sense of reality or my sense of, uh, uh, how things work, I'm not asked, I mean, there, sure there are miracles in, in the, the Torah, which we read every you know, weekend, um, but it doesn't mean you have to listen to them in Reform Judaism. You know, it, it, it's this notion of wrestling with the angel, isn't it? Where yes. uh, that's the act of engagement is what it's about, not the solution, not the definitive answer. And that's very hard for people to live with. They just look at our country today. These so-called patriots, the white supremacists, they can't stand the thought that an immigrant might bring something good to our culture. Mm -hmm. Then they might work hard, that they may love their family, they may pay taxes, you know, they're just, their skin's a different color. 
You know, it, 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 it's a lack of imagination that separates the man from the beast, you know? And, and I, I think Judaism is one of the few religions, well, I don't know anything about Hinduism other than thousands of gods, which in a way is like, that's a safety valve. <laughs> you can always find a God you like. <laughs> um, Buddhism is, is for me, um, apathy. They would dispute it, but um, uh, not to care, I think, is to ignore a divine gift. And I don't, I don't even believe in divine gifts. But if there's anything that distinguishes us in our ability as, as human beings, it's empathy uh, and the, our, abil our ability to question. And that's holy or that's sacred. And that's what makes us human. Yeah. All the animals on the boat, clearly it's only about survival. You know, even, even Robert Parker submits because he thought he, his life would be threatened if he challenged that staff that that uh, pie was pointing at him right and and uh uh they're responding to some very primal needs which are not necessarily base or evil or bad they're natural but what he what pie possesses is this sense of wonder appreciation questioning uh seeing the story of survival as being more than just the next fish you know, but I know my survival is, is tied to Robert Parker's existence. I need him to sustain me. I need a relationship. And that's very human. That that's now we see that in primates too. I watch a lot of Instagram. And as much as I love huskies and golden retrievers, the monkeys are the top of the pecking order because <laughs> you know <laughs> that's primate behavior. There's not enough of them on Instagram, but um you feel that these animals are, they're not doing it because they don't know what they're doing. They have a sense of causation and they're aware of their motives and they have purpose. And I'm not saying they're divine or they're human, but there is this mammalian thing that where we, we feel things. It's not just chemical. It is chemical, I acknowledge as a somebody who likes to think they're scientific without any you know, degrees in that area. Um, but uh, you cannot deny the feeling is real. And, and what we do in movies is to parse and to take apart, to deconstruct our feelings and figure out what in the movie caused the, us to feel that. And that's a way of uh, decoding ourselves and figuring out how we think and, and what was convincing about this and why did I like that character or that moment or what was beautiful about that shot, even if I don't know its far reaching implications for the rest of the movie. You can find that if you drill down into your own reactions. And that's why I've done this group for four years or so because we, we need to examine ourselves and uh, movies thrill us, but like, we have to look at why did I enjoy it? What did it do to me? And then you get into the really good stuff. And of course, this movie is just filled with good stuff, not just you know contemplative, contemplative, uh, conceptual stuff, but it's just beautiful to look at. And that's why I forget who said they couldn't. Mitch said he he couldn't move for two and a quarter hours. It's captivating. So anything that can do that to us is worthy of our consideration. And Brad, I don't mean to steal your thunder by quoting a great English scholar, but I think it was Milton, not Blake, who said, the proper study of mankind is man in Paradise Lost. <laughs> and that's sort of my approach to, to film. You know, this is what we're looking at. You know, the human mind, the human emotive sense, um, you know, and uh, we touch some really important stuff, whether we're reading, you know, poetry that's 300 years old or not. Is your hand raised or are you just holding your... <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm responding to my good friend Miriam's comment about, uh, to her, this was believable, this relationship between the human and the tiger. And, uh, you know, to me, the essence of this movie is that our in everything we know intellectually tells us that this is not possible, that the survival, uh, the law of the jungle uh, cannot make this happen. And yet we buy into it. 
we buy into it because we're able to make the leap that this is operating at some metaphoric level. And if you just accept the fact, if you believe that this is natural, that this is believable, I don't think you can ever get to that metaphoric level that this is operating at. Well, and, and that's, you know, people like me have sort of make a career out of studying how, what are the mechanics of making people oh, yeah. You know. oh, we, we, we know in modern times, we have seen relationships between wild animals and human beings right. that have grown up together, that have been together for a long time, that it's possible. They depend on each other and their normal instincts, I guess, to eradicate each other are abated. So we, we've seen that in so many instances. As a matter of fact, many years ago, uh, I was at the uh, Los Angeles Furniture Mart, and there was a, a whole bra because a woman came into the building with a lion on a leash. I mean, an actual lion on a leash. And it was an amazing story. Of course, I didn't get close. <laughs> and, uh, I, I trust so much, but that was an amazing story. So we know that it can happen, but uh, it's not the usual thing. Yeah, but with Jane Goodall, we see things happening right in front of <laughs> our eyes that are so incredible, but yet are very credible. Right, and why is that? Follow that up. Why is it credible, even though we don't, we couldn't have imagined it ourselves but here is some document that seems legitimate to us that shows it's real. Yes, she seems to have broken all the rules. She simply went over to these very unapproachable, huge gorillas. Yes. That was the animal that she worked with mostly was the gorilla. And she was so unafraid, which is so remarkable because all they had to do was lift their paw, and that would have been the end of this fantastic woman. But they sensed her lack of fear. There was some innate animal instinct in them that made them unafraid when she was with them. They were unafraid of her. They were watching her like she was watching them. Correct. Now, maybe they're processes weren't as sophisticated as hers or drawing in as much data, but they used their instinctive reaction to the cues she was providing them to make them feel secure. And I think this is where the film comes down to, uh, it's about relationships. You know, uh, any relationship is possible. You just have to like not restrict it to language, you know, but to feeling. And that's, that's an area of vulnerability that a lot of people aren't willing to give up. Uh, Jeff, did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, I, I want to look at the, the more mechanistic kind of viewpoint, which is with that, too? that all of the, all of the uh, people on board the ship, uh, the boat died and he was left alone. And, he, and then he says that, that it's the tiger that kept him alive. Mm -hmm. So then what do we understand the tiger to be in that more mechanistic kind of way? Is mm -hmm. it, is it the, the idea somehow of finding meaning, that of finding meaning in in life, kind of the Viktor Frankl kind yes, of perspective yes. here, that the that the, the the reason he is able to survive on that boat for so long is because he found some kind of meaning right. in all of it. Uh, uh, what's the title of Viktor Frankl's book, Jeff? Man in Search of Meaning. Man in Search of Meaning. And he was an Auschwitz survivor. Wow. 
and a scientist before he went into Auschwitz, a psych psychotherapist. And I believe instead of looking at the people who died, he looked at the people who survived and tried to figure out what made them survive when others perished. <clears throat> not because they were sent to the ovens, but because they gave up the will to live, because they panicked, because what, what was the difference? And I think Jeff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but his conclusion was they found meaning in other people. Is that right, Jeff? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. this is a fundamental, and Pi says this in his narration, you know, on, while they're still on the boat before they, they hit Mexico, this animal kept me alive. Just, just like the, the, the Jane Goodall's apes and Diane Fossey's apes uh, saw into her eyes, they saw their own feelings reflected, you know? And, and it's like in their, I was gonna say primitive eyes, in their less sophisticated conceptual abilities, they said, oh, I'm feeling something coming from her. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's, a, it's an affirmation that goes both ways, even if it's not equal. It's, it's uh, comparative, it's equivalent enough to make you feel safe. Um, I, I think uh, Frank wanted to say something. There you go. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you remember uh, a movie a few years back. Tom Hanks was shipwrecked some way. Castaway. Uh, pardon me? Castaway. Castaway. Do you remember? He, yeah, I saw he, it recently. He, he uh, carves or makes in some way a figure that he names. Uh -huh. It's, it's a the doll. Volleyball. And volleyball. he talks to the doll and he forms a real attachment to this doll. And in fact, as part of the story, the doll is lost, it goes over and he really grieves over loss. And the same feeling was in that story that this was a, gave him something to hang on to. It, 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 it enabled him to live from day to day uh, attachment. And it was an inanimate thing. Right. Right, it was the, the volleyball that was. The, I think it's the same feeling that we're. Yes, you're exactly bonding right. even within something inanimate. Right, because you, we need connection and we'll invent it even if it's not there. We will place our faith in false gods or false leaders like Donald Trump or the Proud Boys, you know, because we have a need to believe. We're scared as hell without it. And, and what's Wisdom is, Alan Watts has a book called The Wisdom of Insecurity. And it doesn't make you uh, irrefutably strong, but it helps you to endure what you don't know, being insecure, being able to face that void, whether it's the ship floating in the blackness of night or the darkness of the sea, that's a, the human condition. We are all lost all the time. But we have to come to terms with that in some way. And if it takes a tiger that we imagine on the boat, you know, or if it's really a bad guy who kills our mother and throws her to the sharks, you know, we have to live with that because we have to recognize what will get us through. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't want to say it's the spark of the divine, but it, it's, it's something that we are hardwired to do. And I should have looked this up, but I did read a, report of a, excuse me, a sociology study or a, a zoological study that animals are hard, chimpanzees are hardwired to connect with each other. That um, an individual looking after the good of the group, in other words, altruism is not an invented ideal. It's a survival necessity. In other words, it's inherited. It's an evolutionary necessity, a survival tool that benefited those who had it. Collaboration, connection, uh, 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 the sharing of emotions. It's like when we see these pictures of monkeys grooming each other and picking the gnats off their skin and eating them. It's like, this is bonding. This is like, I need that baby because I, I was hungry once and I found three worms that nourished me for 10 minutes. The, you know, whatever it is, the point is there, it's need fulfillment. Our need to survive, our desire to survive is primary. And the question of 
religion is how do we live acknowledging that and still be moral? How do I not, you know, uh, disenfranchise people? How do I not hate them because they're colored differently or they speak a different language, you know, or they have different rituals than I do? How, how do I acknowledge that we are the same? You know, and, and, and this is what it's all about is seeing that spark of recognition in another being. And, and I think that's what this film touches in all of us. Uh, you can refute that or not. Um, Mitchell's going to come up with a great refutation, right? Probably not. But um, I, I was very uh, impressed on how the author and, and, and eventually director created the character from being this bullied kid who was destroyed in school and they urinated on his stuff. Mm -hmm. And that kind of strengthened him to go the next level and and have become the person who took care of the tiger and survived. Uh, those lessons that he learned in school, I think gave him some of the strength that became who he was. I, I think you're exactly right. We didn't pay enough attention to those early scenes in the movie. They're very well told. They go through a lot of time and show his transformation into being ashamed of his name to being proud of his name and achieving a new status. Um, but it also drove him to religion. You know, the religion happened after he, he got people to be amazed at how many digits of pi he had memorized. You know, so um, uh, you're so right. It, but but it, it's like, we're all wounded people. You know, we've talked about this. But what is a wound? When we looked at the film, uh, Those Who Remained, about the 18-year-old girl who was bitter and nasty and couldn't accept her parents perished in the camps. And the 42-year-old doctor who lost his wife and two sons in the camps, but survived himself. How these two wounded people came together and healed each other enough so that they could go on and lead more fulfilling lives. So it's, it's about what, how do we serve each other? What's our function in each other's lives? Uh, Brad and then Miriam. Uh, uh, coming back to Viktor Frankl, uh, what he says in Man's Search for Meaning is that those that were able to survive the experience were those who could displace themself, themselves mentally from their current situation and project themselves into a future. And it was the power of the mind that help them to survive. And in this movie, it's the power of the mind which conjoins with a faith uh, in the same way that the lion and the lamb uh, lie down together. These, he, he, he has a very a beautiful tribute to his father in the yes. movie at the end of the movie, for that belief in, in reason and logic. And yet at the same time, he finds God. So he can join, he's able to conjoin the okay, two. Okay, there you go. He, he, he's able to find the nuanced way of living in between those seemingly polar opposites, even though they're not. Uh, I'm so glad you brought that up though, because what we're seeing in our own country you're saying that the uh, the bullying led him to a more ecumenical point of view because he was seeking something that could solve that. And uh, if you look at the uh, the polarization in our country among ex you know racial and ethnic extremists, it's like they think they found an answer, but they've gone to the wrong solution. You know, they've gone to an extremist solution, uh, uh, a lack of ecumenism and a lack of uh, common humanity. Uh, because it, it works for them in the short term. And it, it, it's, a, it's a really nasty Band-Aid, you know, that allows you not to feel the suffering you're causing. Uh, Miriam? Um, Jim, I'd like, if possible, you and Brad, who is in some of my other classes, and I always enjoy what you have to say, Brad, I always do, help me personally find the words, the words are literally lacking. 
what these people have, the Jane Goodalls, the Fosses, the, um, the Pies that ends up sitting next to the tiger and stroking him like he was a baby and letting all his affection and his hands and his feelings and his heart go out with vibes to Pi. So that Pi understood this Pi, a ferocious animal who uh, could not speak, they could not communicate. But what other better way to communicate? What exactly is it that Victor Frankel owned in his psyche so that when he had a tiny piece of bread, he felt compelled to give a very tiny piece to another human being if he was asked. He could not say, you know, what exactly do they have? What allows Jane Goodall to walk with her two feet over with tremendous faith and lack of fear over to several huge gorillas sitting together. What is it that these people possess? Is it that they believe there's goodness in everything and everybody? Do they believe that? Is that what empowers them? I don't understand what takes away their very realistic, basic human fear and leaves them without it or above it or devoid of it. I seriously need an answer. <laughs> Brad, you first. Yeah, you've said it already. Yeah, uh, a beautiful question, Miriam. I'm not smart enough to give you an answer. Yes, I think you said it already, Brad, in that we trust. We have the imagination to suspend our disbelief about the apes or the tiger and to say, I'm feeling something from them. I think I'm feeling what they're feeling. And I have enough confidence in my own instincts to approach them. <clears throat> it, it's not like I don't have enough confidence in my imagination to believe that some Mexican immigrant from, uh, from Mexico or Honduras or Guatemala, you know, has, is not gonna come and bring drugs in and rape my daughter. You know, it, it, no, that's not imagination, that's paranoia. Imagination, humanistic imagination is, trusting in your own feelings about someone or something else to act upon them. And it's not an act of arrogance. It's in a way an act of submission, not just to your own feelings, but to the, the person on the other side. I'm willing to trust them enough because they've given me enough information to trust them. And I think I will be better off for having trusted them for than not having trusted them. I don't know that the calculus is quite as uh, practical and, and thought out as that. It's a feeling. And, and you know, we're, we're really talking about what makes us human. And these people are just, uh, vulnerability makes us human, not just bravado, not just hatred and anger. They're real feelings, but so are vulnerability, submission, trust, uh, Believing in your perceptions, mm -hmm. believing in your imagination, imputing feeling into another being. This is, uh, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's more human than animal. Yeah. So that's my answer. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not, spe what makes them special is that they're able to do this. And I don't know what, about their upbringing. I know Brad's upbringing was so stellar so that he could do it. I know I was not brought up to be terribly sensitive to other people's feelings which made me terribly sensitive to other people's feelings because nobody seemed to be sensitive to mine. You know, another story for later, but <laughs> we all come to it in different ways and for different reasons. And this is what the life journey is about. How did we get to be here, who we are, knowing what we are, having our sense of other people. This is, uh, the, you know, you can think back to when you were 16 years old, say, what's life all about? You didn't have a clue. And now we can sit here for an hour and a half and talk about what life is, what life is about, you know, and still not come to an answer and be satisfied. At least we wrestled with it. You know, it, it's, it's funny. We come up, 
we become connoisseurs of our own insecurity and therefore we're able to make art out of it. We're, we're, a liable, we're liable to understand it more deeply and not to be so scared by our own doubts. Whereas these Cretans, you know, who are too large a part of our nation are infuriated by what they don't understand and what they don't know and feel threatened. And sorry, I, I don't mean to get on my political pulpit and I know most of you agree with me, but it's a shame that in our culture, we have not uh, cultivated empathy as more than we have. You know, I see it in my own children that, that they in their high school education uh, and in their social experience with more diverse people are far more empathetic and imaginative than I am about considering somebody else's feelings, regardless of their color or their language. Um, for me, it's, it's, uh, I've taught myself to do it. But when I was 16, I was an idiot. You know, Not that I was a right-wing fascist or anything, but it, it comes with living and, and it's a, it's, it comes earlier to some people. And it, it's, it's like the spiral of culture and education and, and connecting with people. We keep repeating our mistakes, but hopefully they're at a higher level or a lower level, <laughs> you know, they become more trivial. And we're doing the, the more important things more correctly than we have been. Change is slow, you know, Miriam. And, and I think that's part of your question. Why aren't we better off? Why do we still have white racists, you know, supremacists here, you know, 100 years, 160 years after the uh, Emancipation Proclamation or 60 years after uh, the Civil Rights Acts and the Voting Rights Act? And why are people trying to reverse them? It's incomprehensible, yet we're doing it. So we're still this profound contradiction between good and evil, between selfishness and generosity. Um, that those here in our group tend to acknowledge as reality, you know, and can live without slitting our wrists at the, uh, the irony and the pain of, of the contradictions that are in front of us every day. Uh, it's a gift, you know, and, you know, um, you know, we're here because I think we share that gift to, you know, in some respects. And that's, that's what movies do to us. I hope so, it's what they do to me. And um, why I pick movies like this. It's exactly the kind of discussion I, uh, we often have here. Um, so it, we're coming down to the end of our session. If anybody else wants to speak up, I've kind of like said it all. I don't want to be too pithy. Uh, Yvette. Yeah, uh, I think you said another reason earlier and I kind of agree with it, that uh, he was alone and none of us like to be alone. And even though this was an animal, he was fearful of the animal, appropriately so, but he knew he had to have something. And therefore he went out of his way to dream up ways to enhance that type of friendship. And it, and it was, it was friendship and he had empathy that I don't think people learn until they're older. I, I don't think any child has empathy. I don't think they understand it. I think that's something you grow up with and you sometimes learn it and sometimes you never learn it. No, but I, I think it was that he needed that. He needed the lion. He needed somebody. He needed a friend, uh, it, it, just it, like it, a dog. He wrote that in his journal. Yeah. He said, the lion gave me, a uh, tiger gave me purpose. I knew I had to feed him and I didn't yeah, want to lose right. him. So that that's, uh, says everything about human connection. We need each other. We need something like that. Even if it's a volleyball, we call Wilson, you know, um, as in Castaway. Uh, uh, Can I say something, Tim? No, you can't. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, I appreciate this wonderful discussion. Um, but I got so lost in the film itself, the making of this movie, I couldn't believe the, where all this technology came from, the beauty of it, the, the fish, the people, the, the, the ship going down. I, I was so, it was so magnetic to me just to sit there and watch what was unfolding. 
I couldn't think about what everybody else was talking about tonight or feeling or thinking about. It was just riveting. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't imagine how beautiful mm -hmm. this film was. Mm -hmm. And I had seen it once before. But when you get older, I guess you can. You do. See more. This is what visual artists do, though. They put into graphic forms feelings said. that can't be expressed any other way. I think, she has no I think all of us were enraptured by the beauty of the mm -hmm. film. And, and uh, even this time, I, I knew what it was about, but I just kept shaking my head at how stunning the images were, Wonderful. how they kept reinforcing each other. And it's because I've thought about it and I made notes and, and I've seen it. I saw it like three weeks ago when I announced it and uh, saw it again this afternoon that I, I have these thoughts about it, but uh, it's like uh, it didn't ruin. Please mute yourself, Frank. Um, it, it, it uh, it didn't ruin the experience for me because I was thinking about it more. If anything, it gave me more to love because I saw how interwoven all these parts were with each other, the parts of the film. And that's okay. Don't, you know, we know you're a sensitive soul, Arlene, so don't, you know, beat yourself up too badly. Uh, because that's how the film was meant to work on you. It's seductive. <laughs> and and um, that's fine because subconsciously it works. It, it softens you up for that ending. I mean, weren't you moved when Irfan Khan says at the end, well, which story do you prefer? Which story did you prefer? The real story. What was the real story? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> the one we lived through. Right, okay, so there you go. See, without even thinking about it, you thought about it, right? You, you, you felt it. No, 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 it happened this way. <laughs> because you got so much meaning out. You, it's like you're rooting for the animals. They could have been people, but it's in a way easier to root for them when they're animals, because then they're not people, you know? <laughs> okay, well, this was a great discussion. I'm so glad uh, you all enjoyed it, and I'm so glad you participated. Um, it really gets to a kind of a fundamental humanism about what movies can do to us emotionally and psychologically and um, spiritually, if you go that way, they really bring you down to the core of your being when they're good. Uh, it's because they, they engage so, much, so many different parts of our minds, uh, verbally, performance-wise, empathetically, visually, and then the continuity of the film and how it builds, the scenes build upon each other and take you to a conclusion you couldn't have imagined at the beginning. This is the magic of, of, of what really good cinema is about and what we try and do here. So I have to apologize. I have nothing to announce for two weeks from tonight. Um, I've had a few issues in my life, as some of you may know, and they keep me busy, but I am watching a lot of films and you should thank me for the films I don't program because I <laughs> save you a lot of grief, but there's some fun, there's some fun stuff out there. I encourage you to, uh, you know, go through Netflix and Amazon Prime, and you can do just the freebies if you want. Um, and uh, I'm still hung up on whether, you know, what to program, because I see films, I say, I wasn't going to do that, and I see it again, I say, oh, that was pretty good, you know, and what could we talk about? Um, <clears throat> so I promise uh, something quite as good. I'm still waiting for The Duke with Helen Mirren and Jim Broadbent about the postal worker who steals a precious painting and then ransoms it to finance a charity in the English comedy. Um, and, uh, oh, a couple of Jewish films that I can't figure out where we can screen them. Um, this kind of a cute French film called Queen to Play about with Kevin Klein and a French woman about a housekeeper who learns to play chess and becomes a champ. It's amusing, but not good enough for us. But if, if you're looking for movies to see that ha have some substance and will charm you, um, I move them all. Uh, I watched The Joy Luck Club, that old Amy Tan novel turned into a movie. It's kind of a confusing film because it's the story of various Chinese immigrants. It, it doesn't do as good a job of explaining the 
Chinese immigrant experience that the farewell did for us, um, which is about just a grandma who's sick with cancer and her family won't tell her, but the Americanized granddaughter wants to and all of that. But it's worth seeing Joy Luck Club. Many of you probably read the book years ago. Um, I, I keep it a, a list of uh, the films that I reject, but um, I didn't print them out enough tonight. Uh, but I also enjoyed it here at the Winds with Spencer Tracy and Frederick March years ago. Um, uh, I don't think it's, you know, we're beyond it now, but who knows, it may come back. Um, lots of Holocaust films I don't want to burden you with. I pick those very carefully so you don't get too inured to them. Um, <clears throat> and if you have any suggestions, please send them to me. I mean, films do escape me. Um, you know, films that I've seen in the past. Um, and uh, you'll hear from me by email what we'll do in two weeks. I have to clear the dates with the the powers that be at Wilshire Boulevard Temple. But I'm so glad you're with us. I thoroughly enjoyed this and I'm glad we took this discussion to where I'd hoped it would go. I think it's all really in the film. And I see any film by Ang Lee, frankly, um, he's a really great filmmaker. Uh, A-N-G space L-E-E. -E. Uh, I believe he won an Oscar. This film won three other Oscars. And uh, uh, We'll talk soon. Until thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Good night. Anna, thank you for your stewardship. And we'll see you all soon. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.